Hi everyone, welcome back to What the Fintech, your fintech feel good show. What the Fintech is a news and information platform covering the latest fintech development in Hong Kong, Singapore, China, and Asia. Join us every week for an engaging conversation with various Asian tech leaders to discuss entrepreneurship, emerging technologies, customer engagement, and partnerships. And today we have Miles and Christy from Fano Labs. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Thanks I'm for having us. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you, especially I see recently a lot of good news on Forbes and a lot of posts on the social media. Everything looks to be fine for you guys. Yep, thanks. We're just doing what we do, trying to promote the fintech industry. Um, maybe we can uh, introduce you before we start the discussion about Fano Labs. We can maybe start with you, Christy, and after this, Miles. Hi, Mandy. So I'm Christy Ho, Marketing Manager of Fano Labs. So I joined Fano Labs a year ago, and I really wanted to help uh, how to promote like AI into the Hong Kong community and also the, and, like let people know more about what language AI can help them, not just from enterprise, but also in the in society and in the whole you know, well-being. So I'm glad to be able to join Fano Labs, and thank you for having us today. We'll talk more later. Thank you. Hey, I'm Miles, I'm founder and CEO of Fano Labs. I founded the Fano Labs about seven years ago. Sorry, a bit, late, a bit old already. Uh, you know, from when I was after, I was, I was actually a researcher at the University of Hong Kong. In 2015, I decided that, you know, it's time for, it's not for academia. So I decided to try to commercialize what we build in, in school and turn those into commercially available products. So we've been doing, we're primarily doing like language AIs, we're processing human languages. So in particular, we build machines to try to analyze human audios and tell us inside the audio, how many different people are there? Who are they? And what time do they speak? What do they say? And what do you mean by saying that? We turn everything and we, we turn all those things into business insights and bring it to our clients. So we've been running this for seven years. So I used to be a, a guy writing code, designing algorithms. Now to so someone to go around and talk about what we do instead of doing hands-on research anymore. But we're happy to be around here. So thank you, Maddie, for having us. Thank you very much. Um, like we know each other for a really long time now, so it's uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. I saw the company growing as well. Um, I saw you like having like a lot of partnership with a large company here in Hong Kong, but also sometimes uh, overseas. Uh, so my question would be like, you start this entrepreneurial journey a long time ago, right? And uh, most of the entrepreneurs need to be inspired, uh, you know, like they try to be a best version of themselves. So was it your journey as, as well to start your company and, you know, from research to be a CEO and founder? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a, sci I'm a scientist by training. And as a scientist, I'm a scientist slash engineer. So in my, in my mind, I love what I do when, when, I, when whatever I built, you know, it's actually put into good use in good hands of people mm -hmm. and they actually give it help. So I actually, I, most of my team actually, including in my, my research team as well. So we're heavily inspired by the sense of achievement. That means I want my son, I want my friends, I want to tell them, that, hey, I built this and you're using it. Mm -hmm. You might not know that's us, but now I tell you, you know that I built that. Mm -hmm. And that's tremendously helpful. That's something really makes us feel like really inspired. And that's what actually makes us tick. Very good. And both of you, what is um, the favorite thing you, you are doing every day on your job? Maybe Christine can take on that okay, one. Okay, I'll start first. So um, I don't really have a daily routine because it's very dynamic every day. But what I do mainly like over the span of the at least half the, the past year is mainly I help with um, Fano Labs, uh, different kind of marketing um, initiatives. So uh, as you, you probably have seen us everywhere on LinkedIn and um, not just on LinkedIn, not just social, but also like uh, other media exposure, like uh, PR, and we do like press release. So recently we had a, a press release announced. So we had a partnership with Cathay Pacific to help them with uh, building their advanced conversational AI to digitize um, the customer interactions with people, you know, like how uh, flights are all coming back right now. So uh, there's a huge demand for uh, people requesting on uh, their live chats and WhatsApp. So uh, our our announcement on the partnership is mainly um, to uh, to announce like Cathay is also uh, part of like not just a uh, big uh, air airline, but then they're also a, a leader on corporation um, digitization. So um, what I'm I really like about my job is. Uh, it's, I don't just treat it as a job, but it's really inspiring for me to understand how uh, Final Labs is not just a startup company or just a technology company, but we are also a partner to actually drive um, digitization in, in Hong Kong, in different society, in different scale, and also in different uh, industries as well. So that's one, one of the most favorite things that I like about my job. Collaboration. Is what important. about you, Miles? Yeah, I, 
I think nowadays when I every day when I make wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is spend a little time with my kid. Okay. Right, because uh, it's eleven years old, very small. But I, I normally go go home very late, so I don't get to see him in the evening. So I try to spend a little time in the morning with him. And after that, I'll just I every day I'm mostly driven by calendars. I mm-hmm. check my calendar. What I think I gotta do. Where am I gonna be? Like this morning, I check my calendar. Oh yeah, I need to be at one chai ten a.m. in the morning. So I plan my day based on the calendar. Yeah, but、um, sometimes it gets boring to be honest. Like you're driven, you're not driven by what you want to do. It's driven by the calendar set for you. But on the other hand, it's also interesting to feel that you actually everybody try to get a piece of you at、mm-hmm. some point. So that's also feel like yeah, I feel like a a little bit sense of achievement as well. So now it's、uh, I feel like I'm a little bit more important than before. Yeah, but at, eventually I think it's just、um, nowadays we're just running. We we have a bigger team, bigger organization. We're running different things with different clients, and also I have to. There are lots of things we have to do. Like we have to do visit client, we have to do client visit to see what's really going on because you 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 ship a product to clients, right? Technology change over time. You also want to know what's what's going on. What are the room for improve,、uh, improvement? Because you can't you can't expect whatever the technology go today. It's gonna last forever. So someone is gonna get some come up with something better. It's gonna be someone else, or it's gonna be us to do something better. So that's also something that's it's on top of my agenda. So go around, see what's going on, get a feedback, think about how we can better build our products. That's actually that's also my favorite part, by the way. It's you're getting it's like building confidence, like、uh, growing a baby. Now I have a real baby. You know, it's like seeing both of them grow every day, and also over time, that feels great. Very good, very good.、Um, I know that、uh, Fano Labs is a cross-industry company, and、uh, you are doing a lot of things. You introduced quickly the company at the beginning, but maybe you can share a bit more about what you are doing or what are your、uh, best sales or product number one that people really like and like, you know, attract the customer to you. Yeah,、uh, nowadays I think we are most famous in the financial industry as a reg tech company, so a regulatory technology company. So what we do is actually、uh, in the banking industry. Whenever a bank Whether it's a you know a licensed private bank or is an unlicensed wealth management firm or is a retail bank, wholesale banking. Whenever a bank communicate with a customer, okay, according to the, the regulations and laws in here in town, that conversation needs to be recorded, especially if the conversation involves a transaction. And, and the reason why it's re, it's it's recorded because every time I do a banking, right, normal banking service is fine. But when it comes to buying stuff, like the banks, you're trying to buy an investment product from a bank, there are certain risks. Associate with that,、and、you also need to be able to understand that when you're buying, you're okay with the risk. You understand what you're buying, and you 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 fully understand. You're fully you do you buying this out of your own will instead of somebody soliciting or soliciting or you know forcing to buy. So that's actually it's part of the banking conduct area. So that's all the banks and licensed institutes needs to be need to be able to follow the conduct, make sure they are. Uh, treating investors' money, you know, they're treating investors with respect, with professionalism, and more importantly, investors they want to buy something, they're well informed. So that's actually something Hong Kong is fairly proud of, of having something called having very high regulatory quality. But the thing is, after recording the sales recording, a sales、uh, process are recorded. Someone else needs to check it, right? Because someone else in the bank need to go look at the recording, check what's going on. Did we miss any critical, you know, risk disclosure? Did we forget? Did we something say something that's marginally inappropriate? You know, in those cases, we need to get back the customer back. Say, hey, sorry, we we're not we're not supposed to say this, or sorry, I forgot to tell you this. We now we give you this additional risk related with this product. Are you okay with that? If you're not okay, let's cancel the order. If you're still okay with that, then we're good. Let's go. Let's go ahead. But this process is actually fairly expensive for banks because think about like for large banks, you might have like hundreds and thousands of our relation managers that go in the front line. Their job is serving customers. From now, every now and then, there are some transactions happening. The amount of audio you're going to generate from there it's massive. So when you put in a human to do manual manually listen to the audios, first of all, you can probably listen to three or four percent maximum random sample, and it's not it's it, it's also the job that that kind of job is actually fairly boring. All right, it's going to be very hard to retain talent, and it's also more importantly, it's not really necessarily serving the purposes because you're doing random sampling, you're not covering enough. So what we do nowadays for banks is actually we just apply our technologies to analyze all the sales calls, whether it's a sales call inbound, outbound, or it's a it's a sales process happening inside a branch. Wherever that happens, as long as it's recorded, we get the machines to analyze it, and we're gonna check for every single product you're selling. Did you miss any critical risk disclosure information? Did you do proper KYC? Did you did you have any you know word? Did you say anything that 
might be marginally inappropriate. In both cases, on the one hand, we feed to senior management in the bank, so they will know precisely what's going on. You understand the risk. And on the other hand, we also give them right the, the information real in real time to the to the sales guy themselves. So he's the customer is still in the room. He knows that oh, I forgot to say these two clauses in the term sheet. So the customer has not left yet. So you, re, you supplement the information recording with, oh, by the way, we have this extra two risks. Are you okay with that? You get a consent, customer walks away. The sales, the relation managers are happy. The banks are happy. And our senior managers are also happy because they now they have a holistic view over different risk factors about different things they're selling. Uh, sorry, I was recapitulate by what you, uh, you were saying. Um, so this was your first product that you developed or it was a product you came after like a lot of iteration with a lot of banks? Uh, how that product came on a, no, alive and how did you de develop it? Definitely. This is interesting. We developed this product. The ori origin of this product was not designed for this purpose, by the way. Okay. Yeah, originally when we, our first successful deployment of this product was for China Mobile. That was back to four, about four or five years ago. That was the time when we are when we work with them. Actually, they have a if you use a carrier, everybody uses a carrier. You know, sometimes you make a call to the carrier. You ask about did you whether they, they charge you more than you sign up for. Did you have any issues connecting the internet, so on and so forth, right? You make a phone calls, get a customer service. Every time you make a customer service call, it's recorded, and they're gonna tell you we're gonna record this for training purposes. So behind the scenes, there's also there are also people looking at the recordings. You know, try to find what are where are complaints. Think about how they can improve the service, improve the services in general. But it's also based on random sampling. It's not very effective, and it's also not getting the sufficient business insights. Four to five years ago, we developed this product, and then we worked with China Mobile to launch it. Back at that, at that time, we we're trying to solve a single problem: is well, you have so many customer calls, recordings every single year, but we don't necessarily know why people are calling you. So let's do analytics. Let's understand what a, why the customer call you for. What are the reasons? You know, we do analysis, and from there we develop that. Actually, we further figure out actually there are lots of customers who actually called you to complain, but you did not necessarily know about it. And sometimes they, when they complain, they complain about your fundamental services. And if you don't fix it, they might leave. So we spot the customers who might actually leave because they complain with you, or they they come in with some. You know, your competitor might be lobbying your customer. So we try to find a customer who might want we might be leaving. So you can follow up with them, tell them, you know, say we have a plan to expand the coverage. You tell them something that, oh, I'm sorry, we, we miscalculated. We're going to give you some, you know, coupon, right? It's a, it's a token, so on and so forth. And you ask customer to renew the contract. So that brings in lots of revenue. So customer don't leave that much. And also at the same time, customer are happy because they just called it, they just filed a complaint yesterday and you actually have someone to follow up. And at the same time, we also, by analyzing, you know, the call categories, we know how the trend changes. I say, for instance, there's one, there's one instance where we launched a campaign about um, 5G service plans. So we have a marketing doing all the 5G-related marketing stuff. With and we, the marketing manager said we're probably doing fine, but we had then at the time by using our product, we say well, let's have a hypothesis. Let's let's agree to disagree. Maybe you have something missed out, which will trigger a customer to call you. I mean, the customer who are interested in the plan. So we run analysis over like four years, four months of time period after they launched the and web their launch product and compare that with the before they launched the marketing campaign. We realized there's actually lots of customers asking about something called family plans. Like, can we share the plan with my family, for instance? Mm -hmm. But that was not something covered in the marketing material. So that triggered a customer to call you. And the decision will be, well, let's include that into our marketing campaign. So customers know that you know you can get a family plan based on you know on this new network offering. All right. So that's it. on the one hand, you know, customer is more effective customer message delivering message delivery to customers. And the other hand is also reduce costs because every day somebody calls you, they're gonna wait. You're gonna spend money answering questions, right? So that's also we start working on all this kind of uh, analysis, trying to figure out ways based on the customers' voices. We're trying to understand where are the areas the organization can you know can improve. And China Mobile is one of our customers. We have many more customers. Like the one, the press release we launched with Cathay Pacific is also along this angle. So that product was not particularly designed for financial industry at the very beginning. Okay. And about three years ago, so we were very fortunate. We come across you know a whole bunch of banks, right? Mm -hmm. Among all of them, this I came across JP Morgan. Their Asia CTO was actually a good friend of mine. So we're chatting. I, I show him what we're doing and this that. And all of a sudden, he said, "Wait a minute, in a bank." We have this use case. We have this. You know, we we also listen to audio. We also we're also okay. We you know analyze. We also want to understand, you know, this um the different kind of uh you know synergies and why customer called us so on and so forth. 
but more importantly, we also have an angle, a compliance angle, which is we need to make sure that where, whenever we sell something, we're selling it in a responsible way. So we make we're make sure we're make, we need to make sure the customer well informed, the decision investment decisions are are great. But that's that's actually why you know, you know how the, the bank gains the reputation on global scale of the bank that customer investors can trust. So I said, but we're doing it manually. So you know, technology can help. So that's where all of a sudden we got inspired. Wait a minute, this technology could be applied to bank. So we start working on a pilot with them to change the product because we need to change the product a little bit to specifically fit for the financial industry. So working with them, and from there we start talking to more banks and realize this is actually a common problem. And as we get more banks, we'll start working with us, like Hansan Bank, for instance, start working with later on. We also realize, you know, we will actually improve our product substantially. So we actually over the past three years, I think we shipped over forty versions of the product oh, 40 over time, versions. forty or forty versions. We keep releasing new versions every time we add more features or we change some features that's not really you know user friendly. So we we actively take feedbacks from the industry. We're not we did not create the product out of nowhere. You know, we're not like that. We created it based on a client telling us there's a need. And we look at a problem, we say how we can solve the problem and can we solve it better over time. That's how the product came along. And you mentioned like you did 40 version of it. So it means like every time you work with a bank, it's a new process, it's a new workflow, or you need to add like some features on this product? No, it's uh, interestingly, we know that if we realize most banks, they have huge commonality in the way they're going to use the product. The version, the 40 versions we released was actually more about iterative process. So every, it's not like you can buy 40 versions of the product right now. We only give you one version of the product. Mm -hmm. It's just we did 40 iterations over the years and we're still iterating right now. It's mostly because we we need to find a find a grant a fine line between you know different among different banks. Like you may want things this way, but is that something that someone else also need as well? And if you need it this way, why? Is there a particular reason, right? Or or is that a, of some industry reasons? Because after we iterate forty times, when we now when we talk to a new a new bank, a new banking client, we basically tell them you're not just buying a technology, right? A product. You're buying the collective input from. 40 other banks, they all work with us. And, and we realize we iterate so many times, now we know that this is a way, this is gonna solve your problem better. You might have a new idea, but that idea we tried it before, maybe we tried it before, you might get it, get us in a dead loop later on. All right. So we start accumulating this kind of uh, experiences so the products get better. So at the end of the day, we're not trying to tailor made a product, uh, a project for every single client. We wanna build a pro product that everybody can benefit from it. That's actually the idea of community. So why we have a FinTech community is every bank, although you might be competitors, but at the end of the day, when you look at a technology product, you can be a common, we can, we can find common grounds, right? Whatever, because whatever mistakes we work with, we will learn from bank A, you know, that improvement can bring benefits to all the other banks that work with us. So we, we spoke about community, we speak about reg tech and analytics who are not sometimes sexy. How do you transform everything with your marketing skills to make it sexier and uh, bring more customers to come to the company? I think that's similar as how this podcast is named, like what the fintech. So how are we going to make it more sexy and more attracting to uh, not just uh, enterprise, but actually um, make people understand what language AI is and what fintech is. So I think um, in the in the past few years, I think it's getting easier and easier because uh, the word fintech is more uh, well known and the entire ecosystem is also helping to boost it. Uh, either it's uh, the government or either it's in the industry or podcasts like these. So um, in different levels that we uh, in for FANO, so we have different levels of um, like we can say like marketing tactics to to um, have to focus on different target audience. So uh, mainly for uh, our biggest uh, target audience, of course, is the enterprises, banks, and and that will definitely, be, like first we'll have to make a very professional image on what we do. So uh, we're not just, we're not, um, actually we've already uh, been in the industry for few, uh, seven to eight years. So for Vandal Labs, we will try to like, uh, position ourselves as a tech uh, in, this, in the tech industry, as a tech company instead of just a startup. So that gives confidence to um, our clients, especially people who work in um, big enterprises like, like as banks, because they do have concerns on like collaborating with uh, maybe a very small scale company. So in both ways, um, we grow the company uh, both in talent, in products, in our services, in our technology, but also uh, we put that image out there and tell people that 
hey, actually, uh, you can trust us. Uh, we provide good service. Says we provide uh, good technologies that you cannot find elsewhere. So uh, that's one of the key points that we we are trying to um, brand ourselves, but also not just a branding uh, strategy, but also as a company growth strategy as well. So um, that's mainly uh, what we do. But actually, when I talk to my friends, so when we when they ask me what I do, uh, what my company does, we have a totally different way to tell them. So. Uh, actually, to p- put it very easy, is something to relate to what they actually do and what they apply every day. So, um, let's let's say if I meet you on the street and you ask me what I do as my career, I would I would tell you in ten words that uh, what we do is basically we help people to uh, we we use AI and we help people to uh, understand and find the key ways to understand when how people interact because when we don't um sometimes when human we don't actually understand how people interact uh maybe the sentiment behind it or uh what what is the intent of of these interaction but actually i can tell you, you know you know what like ai and computers can actually help you with that so um and then they will probably have different kinds of kind of questions um based on their different backgrounds but then that's uh what we tell we try to make things as layman as possible to actually un- let people understand like AI is not something that's very scary, very abstract, very um, like you don't know what that is, but it's, it's, it has a rocket science part of it. But then as long as it can apply to our daily life and uh, in, in the industry and you actually see how the benefits that it brings you, then that's probably what we already um, we are trying to do and we hope to succeed one day. Yeah. It's, it's very clear. Um, there's a lot of AI company here in Hong Kong, and I know Hong Kong tried to push to be the AI hub in Asia, right? So how do you differentiate yourself, your company, compared to maybe the other startups or some of your competitors? Yeah, um, there are a whole, whole lot of things where we actually differentiate ourselves in the market. So first of all, you know, what our technological specialties is actually processing something called multilingual environments. So basically what happens if somebody, like here in Hong Kong, like people, most people speak at least two languages, or there's uh, English and there's a mother tongue. And about 95% of people actually speak three languages, like Cantonese, that's Cantonese, English, and Mandarin. And the thing is when people are multilingual, so what, what's going to happen is actually when they talk to each other, there's a tendency to mix and match, right? They're going to mix English into Chinese. They're going to, start ch- talking to each other like just now Chris now we're chatting quickly chatting in Cantonese when you came in we, we, we switched to English mm-hmm. so that's also a, a language switching happening but that kind of problem is not it's not a problem you know you're, you're kind of elsewhere other than Hong Kong Singapore in this region so we've been working we can be working to solve this particular mixed language and language switching problems over the past more than that de- more than a decade so that's uh, that's where we can all you came from and where I think we're probably the world's best at the moment in doing this kind of a language scenarios. We have the highest accuracy or the highest robustness in technology. And also more importantly, we also have a huge industry expertise. So we're doing lots of industry. We understand what the industry is doing and what, why enterprises are, you know, what are the use cases that might work given the current technology standards and what are the use cases that might not work. So we we don't normally, we also have a brand when it comes to talk to customers and say, hey, we're not here just to make you make money out of you. We're here to solve your problem, so that's why there's, you have you might have a wild dream, but I can I might someone tell you no, you know what? That's probably gonna need another five years. It's not ready yet, and you should you can consider try something easier and create a build off to there. But you will need time. So there are lots of time. We also we also discourage customer from going too wild because at the end of the day we wanna we also have a very strong expertise in coming up the coming up the roadmap. Like what are things you can do right now? You can bring immediate immediate business benefits. What are the things you consider doing next year, two years later, or three years later? And what are the things you consider putting a roadmap as a, as a dream to five to seven years later? So we're also very strong in doing that. So over time, we have a big, we have a big brand, you know, huge reputation of um, not a tr- not only a trustworthy technology provider, AI technology provider, but also a trustworthy advisory kind of a, a firm. We don't charge our clients for you know, giving us advices, but we mostly tell them the honest truth, like what are, what we think is the right thing to do, what are the right directions, and we don't touch everything. We mostly just focus on what we do. So that's actually, I think that's actually, uh, that sets apart fairly in some fairly good ways. Um, the technology side is also the business expertise side. 
Very cool. Um, I remember like a few years ago, I was working on some of the proof of concept with DBS or for a previous startup I was working with. And I remember when we used to do the text to speech for in Chinese, for example, for some fonts disclosure, but the name were, was French, English, Swiss, whatever. The AI has a lot of difficulties to switch from, uh, from Chinese to the name of the of Amundi, Fidelity, or whatever font, right? Yep. So now everything is solved. You can like have like multi language in the same sentence, and the AI can do it. Exactly. Oh, this is very cool. Um, so you mentioned about how you collaborate with startup, uh, with a uh, big bank, sorry, and uh, insurance, for example. So creating the different iteration, going from phase one, phase two, phase three, creating all the steps to help them to have a solutions right now with uh, immediate benefits, right? What are some of the challenges you are facing when you work with a large company like Cathay or uh, China, China Mobile or a few other banks? Yeah, I think um, it depends on what stage we were in. Back in the days, in early, very early days, we our challenge was actually we're a very small player. We were a very small player. I think that's going to be a challenge every startup will face eventually when, when it comes to enterprise uh, space. Because when it comes to enterprises, when they want to develop adopted technology, we also need to bear in mind that that's a huge enterprise. They have millions of customers out there. Whatever they're going to, uh, whatever whatever technology going to introduce, that's going to eventually be used by their customers, which might have affect on millions of people. So they, they tend to take a very, they need, they have to be very cautious about what they need. So normally in the early days, our biggest pain in the neck was actually we have to do like a, a POC for two years, right? Very normal. You you start talking about it for a year. As let's do a POC. POC lasts another year or two, and they said no, let's do a full scale full scale rollout. All right. So that means. But from the moment you start engaging until you get the real money coming in, yeah. that's probably we're talking about three years time minimum. So that's that was a huge challenge in early days. It's that's also why many fintech startups actually struggle in early days because they might not necessarily have the funding to last the first three years of of you know building up the initial trust, the initial traction with the large enterprises. So that was our challenge in early days. But later on, as we are getting more mature, that becomes less of an issue because it's it's well after it's well proven. You know, banks, I mean, large enterprises, they're not, they're no longer that hesitant, right? They don't have to, we don't have to do like three-year POC, right? It's probably like a one month or two weeks POC. Just make sure everything's in place and we're good to go. Um, but right now, we, when we come across, you know, in general, AI technologies, we do come across some challenges, but that's more primarily for organizations, you know, commitment. So there are many organizations, you know, out there. They say we want to do AI, but they may their senior manager may not as necessarily, you know, feel committed enough to do it. They say let's do a POC, right? You know, but do we have a plan to roll it out? No, not yet. Do we have someone, some leaders owning the AI roadmaps? May or may not. So I, we do see that as a challenge. Most of the time, if an organization has someone taking up the ownership, like I'm gonna own the organization's AI roadmap, you know, that thing. Typically, the collaboration is going to be very smooth. We're going to do one after another. We gradually know how we can work things to, uh, towards long-term benefits for the, for the organization. But if an organization does not yet have that, it will become a challenge. Right? That's going to be challenge, challenging for the, for the organization to adopt a technology. It's also going to be challenging for us to see and to give a proper advice about how you know, we can you know, work with you in the long run and gradually deploy different AI technologies into organization and bring you incremental values. How did you overcome this uh, uh, challenge at the beginning and keep the motivation to keep going uh, at the very beginning stage when you had like two years POCs? And what is your motivation right now when you're working with uh, this kind of challenge of, with a company who has no ownership of AI or roadmap? Yeah, I think in the early days when we had to like two to three year POCs before we're getting a before getting a real project. So for me, you know, you know, I remember, remember early day, just just now I say I'm a scientist by training, I'm science and engineer by by heart. Um, back in the days when we we're doing POC, it's uh, I think first of all it's very important that we had some really really good clients. It's like we have uh, clients like Cathay Pacific, China Mobile. They've been work, they've been they've been with us since very very early, when we were very very early. So the idea is although we have to spend so much time doing POCs, when we while we're doing POC, they're actually giving us very active and very good feedbacks. And by the time I got the feedback, because back in the days I was the one, you know, I was still the one writing code, right, designing algorithms, doing that kind of stuff. So I feel like, no, that's good. That actually helped me improve. And I look at it and say, oh, yes, you're right. It's not ready. We need to improve. We need to solve this problem, that problem. You know, the three-year POS is more about for us to improve our product, make sure it's really actually really, really ready for very serious enterprise usage. So uh, to me, the reason 
I kept going. First of all, I had my investors, I think, right? Because, you know, obviously, if you got no income for three years, you got you might get bankrupt, right? Mm-hmm. I got many good investors who are supporting me. So financially, we're doing fine. Um, but at the same time, for me, the key incentive of keeping going is actually I have really good clients, very good earlier clients doing POCs with us to give us really good, very, very good feedbacks and to tell us how we can improve. And from there, when I look at every day I wake up, say, oh, we're not, the POC is not finished yet, but we need to solve this extra problem and the problems are real. And that's the problem we never, we, we didn't know we need to solve the problem. So every, every day I wake up in the morning, I say, oh, I have a new problem to solve. You know, some people get the very turned down and say, I have a new problem to solve. But I'm the kind of person, I, I will feel very turned down if I wake up in the morning and say, I have no problem to solve. I got really upset by doing that. I, my best day start with the I wake up in the morning and say, damn, I have a new problem to solve. Mm-hmm. And I feel excited that I have a new problem to solve. So that's actually the, 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 the way that kept us going for the first three, three years. And the products got really good. And the customers love it. I will get more clients. And by the time the second clients, the third clients coming over, the POC time is shortened because everything, most of the problems you can think about, most of the things you need, we already built it during the first POCs. So I think it's, um, that's actually, um, you know, my, I think I will probably credit our most of our success by far to our clients, especially our early clients who actually, to give us very good feedbacks, who actually, the three-year POC, two-year POCs, those are ones actually help us grow. It really helps the products to mature. So that's something I, I that's just my takeaways. Oh, very good, very good. I, I imagine the company grow from like a lot from this time, right? So now you just mentioned before 70 person are working in the company, if I'm yep. not mistaken. So how do you create a great team? Maybe Chrissy, you can reply to that question. How we can create a great team and a great culture inside the company where we can share the value with everyone and, and keep everyone in the company and not leaving, for example? Yeah, maybe I'll take the one first and quickly and supplement. So actually, that one is actually, um, you know, we started off, because actually, interesting thing is that we have a very interesting age group. So in our firm, we have some very, very young people like Christy, you know, like- uh, the youngest. <laughs> yeah, probably like close to, to 2000, you know, that's the kind of generation. Now, we also have some 90s, people born in the 90s. Most of us were born in the late, late 80s, early 90s, most of us. And we also have people born in the, in the 60s or 70s, or seven, probably 70s, in that very older, much older generations. The interesting thing is actually at the very beginning, we, we kept, you know, as a CEO, I, I set a culture. I said, we, you know, if you want to join us, we don't care about age. But what we did is actually we care about, we care about your personality. Do you care about quality? Do you want to solve problems? Or do we just say, you know what, just, I, this is not my problem, it's someone else's problem, you know, that kind of person. So fundamentally, we build a culture about we want our team to be in a mentality to build great stuff, to bring value to society, to solve good problems. So that's what we come across. But setting a culture is only step one. But how do we enforce that if the culture actually goes into goes deep in the firm? That comes in a couple of firms. I have first of all I have my, my HR director to help. So my HR actually <clears throat> adds this culture interview into our interview interview process. So when we do a selection, we look at this part particularly. But after the call is drawing in, we also need to create lots of internal propaganda, internal marketing. That's where Christy comes in help, right? We have to do lots of marketing campaigns. Maybe Christy can share about the things we're doing to really get our teams to, to, to remind them, that, hey, we're doing something great. We got recognized. We need to be, keep doing this. Maybe Christy can tell them on that part. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I think we have a couple of things that we are in place that we are trying to keep everyone aligned on what uh, the company, like the recent goals we have hit or uh, recent uh, deals that we have signed. So uh, one of the most uh, common and, and common practice for every company and of course include, including Final Labs is we have an all hands me- meeting every every month. So where uh, Miles will, uh, will, that's one of the interesting meetings that I will always want to join everyone is uh, where Miles would be, uh, Okay, uh, giving an update to everyone in the company, all 70 of us, on uh, what's the recent success in not just on the business side, but also on the technology side. So even for me, myself, I'm from marketing team. I would also get to know how the product is progressing and to, to actually um, acknowledging how our different teams are, their efforts and, and all their, all, all their um, efforts and they put in. So uh, one thing that... Um, it's quite interesting when I first joined uh, Final Labs is uh, they have this thing called kudos. So kudos is something that we give and we receive. So every month we can um, 
nominate a few people that we would like to openly give kudos to. So we give credits to their efforts, whether they have helped us in a previous project or uh, something that we appreciate that their efforts. So in return, you might also be received. Uh, you may also receive kudos from people that you have helped uh, in the previous month. So uh, this is a regular practice that we do, and um, of course, we, there will be like a, like a. Uh, scoreboard like everyone who will have the uh, most amount of kudos given and received so we try to encourage the culture of really appreciating each other so that uh, we recognize the effort and everything that you made actually could be an impact to the company's success so uh, this is like one of the things that we are very proud of uh, in final labs and um but not just about this, but it's also like the everyday, um, the everyday um, interactions with our team. So uh, I really appreciate how um, everyone's really trying to actually solve uh, the problem within their team and also cross team. So yeah, that's one of the things that I really appreciate in Panel Labs. Pretty yeah. good, pretty good. Um, is the company based exclusively here in Hong Kong or do you have teams also overseas, maybe in Shenzhen, maybe in Taiwan, maybe in other countries? Yeah, we're primarily based in Hong Kong. So we have a, our HQ is in Hong Kong Science Park. Mm -hmm. And we have an office in Kowloon Town. That's our sales and marketing, our customer centers. And we also have a team, an office in, in Shenzhen. That's about 20 people. And we also have an office in Guangzhou. So we're kind of a GBA firm. Okay, okay. Um, I know like there's a lot of companies and we spoke about it before, but some of the companies sometimes when I speak with the founder or with the, uh, the employee of the company have mentors. Do you have any mentors? Do you have like anyone helping you on your, I don't know, like on your strategy or just give you some advice as a, as a human, as a man or woman you need to be? Yeah, yeah. I, I have many mentors over the years. So they're, they're coming to help on different angles. So first of all, many, many of our clients, I view our clients, the senior management as my mentor, most of them. Uh, although I don't, I don't call them a mentor, but they're like mentors to me because they actually, because the definition of mentor, it's not a formality. It's about, do you learn from them? Right. And also, if you have someone you're learning, constantly learning things from them, constantly taking advice from them, then they're your mentors. You might not just, uh, it's not a formality. It's just about the way it works. Right. So I, I view a lot of my clients as my mentors because they give me very good advices and shit, tell me and make sure we are building things that actually solve the problem. But I will also have some like real, like, like with the proper contracts and proper engagements, like advisories. So I have a couple of uh, mentors. I will have a, have a mentor called Jason Chu. So he's, um, He's also one of my angel investors, right? He's a, he's a founder of Cherry Picks. So he, he was actually the person who actually taught me how I should change my, my mindset from a researcher to a businessman. Because you need, you need to understand business. I, learned, I, I, I basically learned business 101 from him. And I also have a, a, a mentor called William Kwan. So, he was, um, so William is a retired business executive from, from IB, I think from IBM, you know. And uh, he was actually uh, the one who could tell me how you can brand yourself and how you engage a customer, how to properly do sales. And I also have a, a manager called Thomas. Mm. So Thomas also invested in us later on. Has a, so Thomas is actually a, a, a veteran entrepreneur. He used to run his company and he exited. You know, he, and now he joined. He, he's back in the US, the US. He's the one who actually told me how I can run a sales organization, how I can build on my... Because at, at the very, in the early days, we do not have a sales. Nobody in our company is doing selling, which is bringing products. Right, but it's okay when you're at a very early, early on. You have a one or two client trying to build a product, and then you you don't need a sales because you can only work with one or two organizations. But later on, when we need a scale, we need a sales organization because we need we need a sales department because we are so many clients. Somebody need to go out and chase the numbers, get the numbers in, in get the revenue in, right? So Thomas was actually one who taught me how I can build a sales department, how I can uh, interview and hire and build a sales team, how do I set set up all the different incentive schemes. And I also have a mentor, like recently I also have a mentor called Raymond Cheng. So Raymond is a former, I think it's former COO of HSBC Group, former executive. He retired about in 2019. And after he retired, you know, he became my, my mentor. Okay. So he's actually the one who actually helped me shape my product strategies, company strategies into the, to fit our product into the financial space. Because by the time, very early on, we're trying, that was the first time we got, we got, we know that we are, this, our products also a fit for the, or the financial institutes, but we don't necessarily have the none of my. By the way, none of my team work in banks before. None of us. So we don't. We're outsiders. So we're trying to. But the, the, if you want to make sure our product works, we need to understand. So William is actually the person who gives us all the devices and insights 
and also the inputs about how we can position our products into the financial space. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Maybe Christine can talk a little bit more as well. And I, so I, when I was uh, when I first started, I think I was about your age. I was uh, when I first started company. I was, was twenty six. I'm getting a little bit old right now, but I was twenty six when I first started. I think you are twenty six right now. Twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah, you're younger. You're younger. Maybe I should start my company next year. <laughs> But yeah, actually, um, this sounds like an Oscar uh, thanks um, ceremony. So um, actually, for me, I well, I'm I'm not ex experienced as uh, you both, so I don't have um, I don't I don't have that many uh, industrial connections yet. But then I think uh, what I look into uh, what I look into the quality of a mentor and um, what I have. Uh, what I have experienced in the past few, uh, past past year in Final Labs is actually everyone in Final Labs. I treat them as a mentor because I can always learn something from every one of them. So, but uh, one of the um, one of the main uh, leader that guided me through uh, was um, actually Miles himself. So, uh, because in marketing, it's just me for now, uh, for marketing team. So uh, mainly I uh, work a lot with Miles on uh, different how to position the company as we grow. And especially in the past year where Final Labs has seen um, substantial growth uh, compared to the past um, probably few years. So within this year, it, it has been grown a lot. So how we position ourselves in different stage and how things are changing in the market where I might not be able to um, no one, because I was so busy in, in my work, but then uh, Mouse is able to uh, tell me like uh, what we need to do, uh, what we need to focus on and uh, how we prioritize resources and what um, even for myself, like how I can grow as a leader or how I can um, improve in different in different scale and different tasks. So um, uh, another uh, kudos I would like to give is uh, for Terence. So Terence Pong is our uh, VP product marketing. So he has been uh, helping me on uh, how I can uh, take a leap from uh, my previous experience in events and to actually understand what AI is and how to tell them, how to tell people in layman way. So uh, he has inspired me on how to like really understand the AI and also, also like to tell people about it and be really excited about it. So uh, that's the two mentors I have. But and uh, also like books are my favorite mentor. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, I think every day we learn something different. And I hopefully like someday I could be a mentor of someone else in the future. Oh, you will, yeah. you will. Um, we spoke about the past, the present, you speak about the growth. So what's next for Fano Labs? Do you have any big events coming, any big projects coming up? Yep. Uh, we're going to, first of all, we're, we're growing really fast. We're also expanding ourselves. Now, not only within the industry, but also on geographically. We also have starting to have clients from Singapore. And also we have, we're starting to have clients in from, from many other parts of Southeast Asia and who also need our technology to accommodate for their multilingual environments out there. So we're growing on, on, on that scale, on a business while we're growing. At the same time, we're going to have a, our annual flagship event, Fanovation, happening towards the end of on 25th of November. Uh, that's going to be a closed door invitation, invitation only event that we're, we're going to gather most of our, our existing clients, their leaders, to come over and share ideas, not necessarily tell them good stuff about Fano, maybe not, not necessarily about that, but primarily from the exchange ideas about how there are different adopting technologies you know, in different industries whether there are some th inspirations they can bring to each other, what are the lessons they learned, what are the mistakes they made, and what are the, 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 the tips they might share with each other. So we're going to have to, we, actually, we have the kind of event every every year. So the next, this is going to be the third year we have a Fanovation event. So this year we're going to do it November 25th. That's going to be a big one. Uh, we are, actually, we're setting up as a, as a routine right now. Funny, the interesting thing about growing a startup is actually, as was like, in our event for us, when we're at a certain stage, every client start asking, hey, uh, Miles, tell me, you know, from an organization point of view, how does my firm compare with the others in the market? Are we above the market? Are we as a pioneer? Are we in the middle of the market as, a, you know, kind of the majority? Or are we falling behind as a laggard? So everybody, especially on C-suite, everybody wants to know about it. So, so and over time, I say, you know what? How about I just host events instead of asking me, you directly do a comparison. You compare yourself, you see what the others doing, you, you make a decision and decide whether, where you are. So it turns out that's something everybody loves because if I'm telling you, hey, you're you are doing great, you know, I might be biased, right? Because you're my client, you're paying me. 
So, so, so eventually, we just try to set an ecosystem. At the, end, at the end of the day, everybody wants a community. Even for the AI, for the AI community, fintech community, every organization, they want to know what the other people are doing. They want to think about what's next for them as well. So that's going to be our, our next plans, geographically expand, you know, work with more partners, and more importantly, start building a better community and bigger community. There is a lot of uh, myth about AI in the industry, I think in Hong Kong, but also in Asia. Do you have like some uh, uh, debug, um, you know, like um, uh, things that you can demystify or debug the, 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 those uh, kind of myths about AI? Yeah. Um, this is something I like to talk to my clients all the time when they first engage me. They say, oh, I have AI, just can we just fire my the most this department? All right, they'll, say, they'll ask me that kind of thing. Just don't, don't think about it, right? So first of all, what is AI? In, in, in the research, you know, from a scientist's point of view, AI is fundamentally just statistics and mathematics. You know, eventually everything built on mathematics. I, I, anyway, so it's, so it's like, uh, it's not as sexy as you hoped. Because if you come to school, you know, we offer courses about AI in Hong Kong University. It's also where I teach. Is if you go to AI, you, you take an AI course, all right? You're going to be surprised how many mathematics we're going to give you. Like half of the course about mathematics, and then and there will be statistics, statistics, and programming. That's all about AI, right? And so it's think about if you think about it from that way, you think if you ask a programmer, you know, what can they build? So you you just pull a little bit more fancy, more advanced technologies, but that's still like AI is just fundamentally that. It's not it's as it's not as you know mystery as you thought. Fundamentally, it's statistics, mathematics, and computer programming. And the next thing we're going to give about, talk about AI is actually just don't think about AI going to replace people. It's never going to happen because well, even for our applications, right, we get machines to listen to tapes, different kind of recordings. We can identify different things. But after we identify something, what are you going to do with that? For instance, I, 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 I look through a recording, you know, like Maddie, you're selling something to, to Christy, and the machine says, you forgot to say this. All right, you for, yes, we fill it out. But there's also, there's still like a 5% chance that we're making a mistake, right? What are you going to do with that? You need a human judgment, all right? Do I go after you or do I, or I let you know so you call, talk to customers, so you supplement that? Or uh, who's to judge? Who's the one to judge it? All right, so these are things that need to be done by human. So humans are really the one to make the judgment, the decisions. Sometimes the decisions can be, you, have, you, have, you need to consider many different factors, but that's not something within the skills, the capability of AI. AI, it's more about you tell, this is that you, you draw a, a pain, so this is actually, this is a boundary, you do this task. AI can do that task, that specific task fairly well, but not when it comes to decision-making, because decision-making is complex, it involves too many expertise, involving the consideration of many, many different aspects. So, so that's actually the two parts of the mystery about AI. We want to demystify, first of all, it's not fancy, it's not. If you do AI, just get ready to really go hard on mathematics. All right, that's the number one thing. Second thing is you do it, adopt, adopt AI. Don't think about it that that's going to replace your job. It's going to help your job. Um, I think we can speak about AI for many hours because I've, I'm watching a lot of video of you know like uh, this robot helping to create new paint by mixing like uh, keywords of like a celebrity and Van Gogh, for example. This is incredible. But uh, otherwise, this show will, will, <laughs> will be more than two hours long. Um, I just want to ask you a few last questions before we stop this interview. Um, is the competition really hard for you to hire talents right now in Hong Kong? Do you have like any competition with the big banks or big corporates with other startups as well to find those uh, uh, AI talent or developers? Yeah, that's uh, absolutely. It's a... Uh... The talent market is, is, is it's, it's fierce. It's like a, so we're on, it's on fire right now. Um, I, I think that's particularly about hiring in Hong Kong. All right, that's the problem because we are the border. Well, we're just open. It's better. Previously, the border was not open. It's not open to men in China. It's not open to overseas. So expats don't want to come, and people from mainland China don't want to come. It's because you're locked in a small island, right? So that created, and then also there are people leaving. You know, some people moving to some other places. So that created a shortage of talents. So everybody's trying to get the, the people. The price is going up, and there are also some, some people, some people going crazy about getting people. But I think, but I think fundamentally it's gonna improve right now that we're open and we're connected to the world again. So we're starting getting expects to come over. So it's getting better. But fundamentally, we do not actually compete with our clients. We do not compete talents from our clients. Is primarily because when we hire, we mostly how we need to hire from you know in our space. We talk there's a there's a customer and there's a vendor, right? We mostly need to hire from the vendor side because we need people to have a service mentality. Because eventually we're providing services to our clients, 
whoever we're gonna hire need to be, be able to have that mindset. So we need to provide services. So hiring from vendors, you know, for, for people with the vendor experience is actually our top priorities at most, at the minimum, right? So, so but we are, so that also means that we're not competing with our clients. We're not competing with the banks and all that, but we are competing with the other startups. And we sometimes compete with other, you know, vendors in, in our space, all right? So, but that's actually, but that to me, I think that's not healthy, right? I think it's, um, it's okay, good people find, you know, good employees find better places to work, it's good. But when it comes, if, if that's almost become a fight, then it's not good, all right? Because we're seeing a lot, we're also seeing that some, you know, I, I see some company trying to hire people, they want to really try to fight and get people at extremely high prices, but on the condition that I'm not giving you a permanent job, we're giving it contract basis. You can sign a contract for six months. What happened after that? We'll see, all right? If the market goes down, it's not no longer that hot, they're going to slash your price or just be out of, walk out of the door. Or if it's still hot, they may probably renew for another three or four months. And it's not good for individual, you know, to develop, right? If you, especially when you're ever trying to get you and you just go around jumping boats all the time, the CV is going to be very messy. It's going to be, you're going to, it's going to make the person, the people hard to find a job. So that creates some systematic problems at the moment. I think the problem, problem will get better. You know, the problem will just go away gradually after Hong Kong is fully connected. Everybody's like, yeah, we're okay to travel, we're free to travel. So we can start moving people, you know, cross border. So Hong Kong, at the end of the day, Hong Kong is that not a place. I mean, Hong Kong is an international place. The majority, a big percentage of our workforce come from expats, people from mainland China, from elsewhere, they come over to work to create value. All right, so that's actually, we need the talent flow to be there. Without the talent flow, we run into talent war. But with the talent flow coming, we, we're, we're going to be in a good position. Okay, very good uh, takeaway, I think, here. Um, really appreciate your, your point of view for this. Um, we are almost at the end of this interview, so I would like to ask you if you have any books you can recommend, podcast or YouTube channel, to understand a bit more about what you are doing, AI, or everything like inspire you. Yeah, I'll share one, just one. Um, I really like the book. Uh, this band is written by the founder of, of A16Z, Andre Horowitz. It's the hard things about hard things. So that's a single, that's the only, the only one book that I actually read it like over seven or eight times over the years. Because that's, I, I would probably say that's probably the best management book for any entrepreneurs or founder CEOs, right? Uh, because um, there are many stories that the author put in the book actually re have strongly relate what, what's happening around us. Like what happens if we have a downturn what happened if you're as a CEO, you're like pretty much broken. You feel inspired, but your team is not. All right, how do you deal with that? And in bad economy, we're going to do, how do you survive that? And how do you deal with investors? How do we deal with all the different kind of competitions coming up? How do you deal with the different kind of uh, 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 clients? I think that's something that it's, it strongly relates with me. So I think I learned a lot from that book. And I, so that's why I, I, every now and then I just open the book and just go through the, some chapters like over again. I love it. And I actually, I would recommend that book to every, to any entrepreneur, you know, who are trying to, who are trying to go through, we're going through that kind of a, the processes. That's my, that's my sharing. Christy, what about you? For me, it's uh, The Rules of Work. So it's a very uh, easy reading book. So it's for people who really want to understand like the fundamental, like best rules, what you, how you achieve in, in work, in different workspace. So whether it's your, uh, how you, how you dress or whether how you speak or whether how you um, manage within a team or how you interact with colleagues. So that's a very easy reading book. It's, it's, uh, it's not very long. It's, uh, it's very uh, short, but then it's um, something that it, it's a short takeaway where you can read easily flip pages within like an MTR journey. So, okay. Yeah. I will read these two books. I didn't know this one. So <laughs> thanks for the recommendation. Where people can learn more about you, about Fano Labs? Yeah, visit our website, www.fano.ai. And uh, the LinkedIn is uh, really updated every time? Or yes. do you have any posts like, for people to follow it? Yes, yes, so we update our LinkedIn, Facebook, and, and WeChat every every week. So you Even can always WeChat. catch the latest updates of Fano Labs. And if people want to apply to a job or have more information, they can reach out via emails or via the LinkedIn or website? Yes. You yes. can also have, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much for joining me today for this episode. It was really interesting. Sorry, I was sometimes so into it that uh, I forgot to ask some of the questions, but you, I had a lot of fun with you, you two today. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you.